uh, we've been making them for four years and we've made a number of live events. We've all been in the UK and the guys from the festival came to see the one we made for a theatre uh, in London called The Barbican and it was uh, in a car park and you had to uh, put headphones on and you jumped in a car and then you got kidnapped. It was all very exciting. <laughs> and the guys came to see it and uh, they were very nice about it, which was very lovely of them. And we talked about what we might do if we came to Singapore. And I've wanted for a while now to finish this series, this world, this vampire world. I'm getting a bit old, and quite frankly, it's indignant, uh, indecent for, for men of my age to be talking about vampires. So we're going to uh, we're going to put the myth to bed. So we wanted to um, to finish it. And when we came here in Singapore in February, uh, it struck me that I, for you guys it would be really obvious because you live here. But Singapore looks like the future to the rest of us. When we come here and look at Singapore, we go, "Wow, this is what the world's going to be like in 20 years' time." And so, if the world is going to end, um, it's going to end here, because in the timeline. You're so far ahead with your gleaming chrome, and you, you've put a boat on top of towers. That's not, that's, that's magic. <laughs> and in my head, you did just like, it just rode away, surfed. Um, and so we decided that this would be the perfect place to do a story about the end of the world. So this piece that we've been developing is called They Only Come at Night Pandemic. And then the idea is very simple, and I know the idea is very simple because... John and the guys came up with it about an hour and a half ago, <laughs> just in time. Uh, is the world uh, is ending because uh, the vampire virus that's been with us since time began, uh, since peoples began, has got out of control in part of this future, the way that we can go across borders and fly and uh, immediately access data. The world has got so quick that finally this virus that has always bubbled along um, underneath the surface has just exploded. And, uh, and now there is a pandemic there's a surge. There is the, the, the vampire virus is ripping across the world. But in our myth, many things are different from the traditional myth of, uh, of vampires and steaks and garlics. But in our myth, you kill vampires with salt. Um, which means that if you're an island, like Singapore, you're surrounded by salt. You're protected. Um, you're protected temporarily. You're not going to hold the vampires back forever because they've got smart. They're, they're cool vampires now. They've got blackberries and business suits and stuff. They're, they're all hooked in. So you're not, going to st you're not going to survive forever, but you will keep going for a bit longer. So Singapore is where the last vestiges of man hold out. Uh, so the vampire hunters of the world. So there's, one, there's a couple from the UK and, a couple, and one from South Africa and some from Singapore. The great vampire hunters of this myth are holed up in Singapore. And you as the audience stumble across this nest, this final uh, castle, uh, fort, because we are the ones that survive. Now we like this idea that um, if, you, if you decide to come to a theatre installation then you've obviously got to be smart and uh, excellent taste and those two things will probably mean that you'll be the few people to survive the uh, vampire holocaust. So we've survived and we're now in the future. And, uh, and we, we come across this nest of survivors and in unpicking this nest of survivors there's, uh, there's many of us. There's going to be 150 in the audience. And uh, I'm ruining the end now, so you've got, to, you've got to promise not to tell anybody. But uh, we're the, the only people who are left alive on Singapore, and the collection of us, this heat of humanity, the beat of our hearts are louder, and the, and the senses of the vampires can pick up on this. So, of course, the minute we realise that we've stumbled across the final nest of survivors, and that we're all there, and we're all that's left of humanity, what a, what a gift to be all that's left. That the mere act of us all being in the same place has acted like a siren and all the vampires are now coming running towards us in ten minutes they'll be here what are we going to do so that's, that's, that's all we know so far we, we've been into the old school which is um, where is it? thank you <laughs> I have forgotten every single time today Mount Sophia and we've talked to people there so it looks like this is going to happen we're going to be able to do it there it's a great space full of really interesting uh, sights and, and nooks and crannies and, um, yeah, I think that's probably enough for now. Shall I introduce the guys? Cause, um, so this is uh, John Hunter. Do you want to give him a wave? Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, they clapped your name. I think they got it on the show. Excellent. <laughs> uh, and, and John's a writer uh, based in Sheffield. Do you want to tell them anything about yourself, John? Um, well, I guess my background is... Sorry, big time. <clears throat> Uh, my background is mostly in sort of film and TV writing, so I'm sort of new to the group, so I sort of bring a uh, maybe, well, it's a, a multidiscipline group as Slunglow Everett. Everyone's from all sorts of different backgrounds, which is why I think the shows are so special and unique. 
So I bring a sort of filmic sensibility to it, uh, I guess. Or I try to. Um, but in, uh, in this case, I think in terms of this show, I think what I'm really trying to bring is the sense of why you should care about the characters because it's very easy to not care about the characters in a horror film because you just want to see them die but if you came and see the show hopefully you'll be caring about the characters because the characters are you and if you can't identify with that character then i think there's a sense that we're doing something wrong and maybe you are too so, so i think that's the real sense of what i really enjoy about doing these shows is how to put you in the story and so i think that's the thing that we're really working on next now that we've got the scenario and the setup so that's hopefully what i'll be trying to build up in the story well uh really introduce our next person <laughs> <laughs> john hunter on the snare drum um, uh, laura do you want to say hello uh, hi yes i'm laura clark and i'm from producer and um, sure you don't want to hear too much from me because my role here is just sort of all the behind the scenes stuff and uh, making everything happen but it's the second time I've been in Singapore, so yes, that's all. Actually, can I ask a question? Yes, of course you can. Yeah. Can you share a little bit? Because the show has been traveling through different spaces. Yes. The concept the of the concept. Concept. Yeah. So what's it like producing at different venues? Um, it all depends on, on what the venue is and, and where the site is. Um, each space has its own. So the show we did in the car park at the barbecue. Um, there's there's different sort of considerations wherever you go. So the car park is full of cars, so we had to get them all moved out, and some people have left their car there for weeks and weeks. Um, so there's lots of things like that that need to happen. Um, different permissions, different timings of the show, where people are going to be at different points, how you move the audience around the space, looking after the audience as well. So there's all those different things that take into consideration. And here it's the heat as <laughs> a so big consideration. <laughs> Brilliant. Hello. Hello. My name is Heather Fenty. I am Slingo's composer and sound designer. I've got co uh, uh, sound designer with my co sound designer Matt. And uh, all right, I'm not too quiet. So. Um, my name is Heather Fenty, and I'm Slingo's uh, sound designer and uh, composer. So I produce all the music for the shows and also design the sound, the soundscapes that will accompany the shows. So I tell them how... Okay. So... They can hear you. <laughs> so um, so um, what tends to happen with a lot of Sunlow shows is that the audience will move about uh, a very large space or a space that is <coughs> unconventional. So the way that we help the audience to hear everything that they need to uh, be aware of is that they wear headphones, they wear a little uh, uh, radio receiver around their necks and uh, these are attached to headphones. So the audience hears a soundtrack, so it's as if they're in a, in a film, they hear sound design, so there's a new world created and they also hear the actors via a live feed, so their microphone, their mic up, and uh, it means that the... Um, the audience have their own personal soundtrack to this show, so hopefully they have a, a more individual experience, a more intimate experience with this show. Uh, and the fact that they are part of the show, this, this helps the scenario. Uh, and the, um, the other thing about... Was say? Oh, it's that they, the, you can hear the characters in the show anywhere in the space. They don't have to be directly in front of you. They can be miles away across a bridge and you can still hear them talking. So in a sense, it's, it's that much more filmic because of that. Uh, and that's kind of how we uh, do this. Brilliant. Thanks, okay. Barney? Yeah. Hello. Hello. Um, I don't like microphones. Hello. I'm, yeah, they don't taste very nice. Um, I'm Barney George. I'm a theatre designer. So I, uh, in the UK, I design set and costume for stage shows. Um, Alan approached me a couple of years ago now, wasn't it, to do the first, or uh, well, probably the second vampire show, which was uh, at the site in Manchester. Um, and prior to being a theatre designer, I have a background in film and television. Um, and I can't stress enough, actually, sort of repeating what Heather said, the sense that you get from a slung low show with the headphones and the fact that you're in a live environment, it is like being inside a film. So in terms of the design uh, constraints but also requirements is it's very much more like designing for a film because you're often using 
live locations where you may find that there are passers-by who are not connected to the piece that are just part of that landscape. Um, but also it gives you opportunities to insert uh, settings of your own choice within a kind of an unconventional environment. As a sort of conventional theatre designer, I'm often required to produce a design in a black box, and that design will be 25 times smaller, and it will go off to the theatre maybe three, four, in some cases, six months before that show even starts rehearsals. Um, in the case of most of the slum low experiences I've had, that design process continues on all the way through right up until the opening night, and in some cases, beyond that, because one of the things that's key about the live experience of a slum low show is you never quite know how that audience member is going to respond, because they're being asked to move around with the piece, and that can affect quite significantly certain design elements. So as a design process, it continues and it rolls and it develops over time, and that, I think, is probably, for me anyway, the most exciting, the most engaging thing. Um, and I guess that's, that's all really I'd like to say, except come and see the show. <laughs> I think if they're here, they'd probably get invited. Yeah, no, <laughs> come and see it. <laughs> Rick? Hello, good to see you all. I'm, I'm Rick Mountjoy, I'm a lighting designer and production manager, which means to an extent I'm responsible for coordinating all the technical elements together of the show. Uh, learning about the space and the new site that we found only, only this week and, uh, and checking that uh, it has all the requirements that we need and also that we know enough about it so that from the UK we can make all of our plans in advance because when we're here we've got a relatively short amount of time to make something that's, that's very complicated and, and there's a great potential that uh, the audience could break it or we could break it or, or something could break that we, uh, we hadn't anticipated. Stop saying break, you're scary. Sorry, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it won't break. It won't break. No, uh, we don't break. Um, the rest of the time I, I work in lighting, mostly in theatre, but uh, I also work in opera and ballet. Um, this is the, song is the antithesis of the, of the work I do, and mostly in a, in a theatre with 2,300 seats, where people come and sit for five hours at a time to watch opera, and, uh, and I enjoy working with Slumlo because it's the exact opposite of all of that. It's the, it's the most up-to-date sort of uh, reinvention of theatre, and it's totally different from, from opera and ballet that's been the same for hundreds of years, and so I enjoy it for that. Brilliant. Thanks, Matt. I think there's one thing uh, that if we can share something with you is this idea of being at the centre of the experience. So with these headphones on, these big DJ headphones that stop all other sound, you're hearing the, the, the breath of the actor and, you're, and, and Heather writes very cinematic uh, music. So you are like you're watching a film except for a film where you can stop watching that character and decide to watch this one, where the actor walk over and stand behind the actor is perfectly fine. If you think a vampire might come through that door in a minute, then you can go and stand by that door, because um, hopefully they won't. So um, it's that you are at the centre of that experience. It's bespoke to you, even if you're in an audience of 150. Um, and, and hopefully, when we get it right, and we get it more right than we do wrong, it feels like that for you. You come away going, wow, that, that was a one-off. And that's, that's what we strive to, uh, to do. And that's what, even though we're in Singapore and we'll be sweating a lot more whilst we make it, that aim will be the same. I think that's it. Is that good? Yeah. <laughs> How many of you uh, remember, uh, I'm old enough to remember this, uh, choose your own adventure books. Yeah. Where, you know, you know what I mean, right? It's, it's, you read page one, and then you draw a dice, decide, go to page 50, and then la 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 la. How many of you remember this? Oh, not too bad. Wow, well done. Um, I, I think my question really here is that how much of that kind of experience... I like them when we're doing <laughs> How much of that kind of experience you know, goes into something like pandemic or something that you guys... I, it's funny, I was saying exactly this to the, to the students at the Polytechnic, uh, that <coughs> when you've got those books, uh, you can choose to kill the dragon or save the dragon. But the book is, and you do that, and you choose to save the dragon, and then in five choices time you die. So you go again and start from the beginning of the book and go through. So in that sense, they're the same, because you have, the, you have choice, but it's still a theatre play. It's still going to end at 10 o'clock. So no matter what you choose, no matter how many pages you turn, it's still, gonna, it's still a book. It doesn't get updated like a Kindle. It's going to, it's going to, so I think it's a very similar experience. But the trick with those books is, as a kid, they were so exciting because you really felt like... Oh my god, I've got to get this right. Even though it's a book, you can go back and do it again. And so with the shows, it should feel like you, it, 
it happens differently every single night. There's a degree to which also that's true. <laughs> it does. But um, it, you should feel at the centre that you're driving the adventure. Yes. Um, definitely. Yes. And, and of course now for folks that are much younger than I am, uh, it's, it's, it's all about... Here, surely. It's all about, you know, the online experience, now. online gaming. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the kind of world and universe yes. that you get locked in for like 72 hours straight and you have to slay the blinking dragon, like now. You know, gain points and whatever to, to slay them. And and will uh, an online thing go into pandemic? No, but we'll have a dragon. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, it, it, the, the, the idea in whatever way it happens is the idea is that the, the show that so you buy a ticket for that starts at 8 o'clock and ends at 9.05 doesn't just, the story doesn't just end at 9.05 and it doesn't just begin it's like at, at 8 o'clock and I think a lot of that will be online and a lot of it will be digital but it won't be the only way so if you're walking from the, the tube, it's not called the tube station the MRT then, then before it's 7.30 and you're walking to the venue to find your then don't be so sure that there isn't part of the show going on right there as you're walking past going, is that? Oh, I'm not sure, that seems weird. The people don't normally have fans. Um, <laughs> and, and just that could be on the internet, but it could be also on the train. So we'll be looking, we're not sure yet, but it, I can't emphasise enough that it really was just from where we were that we came up with the idea for the show. So this is, this is very new to us. So um, we will be finding ways for it to bleed out of the live experience, but it, uh, but it, it could, and it will be, a lot of that will be on, on, on web, but some of it will be live as well. Hello. You just moved. You're asking your second question. <laughs> I'm not fooled by you for one moment, sir. Uh, excuse me, sir. Yes. Could you tell us a little bit about Slum Law, the company, and how, you, how did this name come about? What does it mean? <laughs> <laughs> the company is, uh, the company is uh, 10 years old and it's made up of nine, nine artists and we work sort of collectively in, in, and that really means that... Um, Although it's my job to, to be a director, I might have a good idea about something else. It's unlikely, but I might. Or Barney will have an idea that's about sound, and that's valid. So we work collectively. The, the job descriptions we have are very loose. Um, before the show opens, there will just be nine of us with our shoulder against the wheel. So, so that's the, the spirit of the company. Um, and that's how. So that, in a way, that's the one thing about it. We run a space in, in the UK which has a similar spirit in the sense it's five railway arches. It's a found space, it's, it's very rough, but it's used by lots and lots of artists and we run and they don't pay us to do that. We run that space for them to to, to support their process when they need it. So that's the spirit of the company. The name Slung Low. Um, oh, you're gonna be so disappointed. It's it's very old. When we were very young, our trousers used to fall down because we didn't do our belts properly, so our trousers were always slung low. And uh, a long time ago when I was very young and a lot thinner, uh, now my trousers are just are held up by my belly. But uh, mm. they used to fall down, so that's why we're called Slung. It's very silly, but it comes a point when you can't change the name anymore because too many people know it. So that's where we are. Oh, man, in Singapore, and I tell that story. <laughs> My mother would be proud. Has anybody else got any questions? Where are you guys from? Oh, hello. Does, the audience, does any of the audience actually die? Yeah. Okay. No, dude, come on! Oh, oh man, it's not a horror movie. Hmm. <laughs> Could you imagine? The, the horror. <laughs> where are you? Um, where are you guys from in terms of what? The, are you are, are you associated with the festival? Are you guests here? Where's the? Are any of you press? So, I heard there were some bloggers. What's the sketch? Great. Do you write blogs? What are the blogs on? Um, lifestyle. Lifestyle. Yeah. You're probably wondering where I got my shorts, right? <laughs> 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 no, I can't believe it. <laughs> Okay, and, and what do you write? Technology. Okay. So how long have you been doing uh, alternate reality shows? I mean, if, part, well, part, the, I, think, I think I think theatre is an alternate. I mean, I think the key is that they bleed out, and okay. sometimes they do that. Um, in we don't we don't tell you when the show starts in a way. Um, sometimes that, that happens. John wrote uh, one for us last year that was that was very successful. That it was a lot like the the Choose Your Own Adventure that. They were instalments of prose, and you could find it in different places on the internet. So one of the clues was in an Amazon buy list that one of the characters had. That's right. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I guess I just I, I just want to find out how much of it is digital, how much of it is actually in, in reality. The, so. the vast majority of it is in reality. For, okay. for us, I would say that the interest isn't the technology. We learn the technology where we have to. So, for example, Barney will, will do a lot of video 
um, work it, it looks like from our planning in this. But that's to achieve an effect rather than video being. And the same as uh, we'll learn, we've learned coding when that's been the necessary thing. Uh, okay. For us, it's how why it's how the story is spread is the key. We're still we're still theatre makers rather than people who have a technology interest, but our theatre spreads as wide okay. as we can. So the, the best example is the headphones, where the, the technology to do this does exist in some forms, but but not in any way uh, affordably uh, and not not reliably. So you can create little mini radio stations, but they don't really work. And so we found the technology in. Um, if you've got a cricket match in, in uh, Britain, you can buy a box so you can listen to the umpire give all the, give all the, and we discovered that these boxes could be bought and the transmitters could be bought and they, it could then be, you can jack them in with a car battery and put it on a trolley and all of a sudden, and that's a very good example of the type of company we are, is we couldn't find a solution from the sound world or the theatre world or the TV world and in the end we ended up in sport and nicked a bit of their kit. Um, so that's that's how we come at this, rather than because we're desperately interested in technology. Okay. Magpies. I think Can we're like magpies. The little boxes that you talk about are they similar to the what the translators use when they go to the conference that they click on? They're very very similar. They're they're, they're slightly more but, robust, but, but yes, it's a. Um, but the sound can swing one. Is, um, the song, whatever you call it, soundproof. The headphones are still in another different category because I've been to one of those before, and the headphones is really horrible. Oh no, the headphones are like DJs. You know the big yeah. bouncy, fluffy ones. They sit on your head because the benefit of them is a they don't fall off. Yeah, they don't. Um, and did you like my mime? I thought it was <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, uh, and then, uh, but they also cancel the other sound out. With those, you then can't hear passers-by or. So are they going to have like little back wings on them? Little bat wings. I don't know. You can dress yes. them up, you know. Yes. I don't go. <laughs> I've just we've just come up with an idea for a show, but bat wings are in. Bat wings, trousers that fall down, and I think Marks and Spencers. I can't be sure. <laughs> Any other questions? Hello. I am Paul. We'd like to know how much of the script is actually written out beforehand. How much of it is there? Is there a can we stand up? Yeah, we stand up. Felt like I was. Yeah. Uh, the script is. Um, I will write a script. Whether that's what's performed on the night is a different matter <laughs> to an extent. Simply not just because the actors don't like me or what I've written. I hope, but also they will respond to the audience and what they're doing there. In terms of one of the online things we've written. Um, I had uh, blog posts and articles that went live every day for the period that was written, but I was also sitting by my computer 24-7 for the week, responding to what anyone wrote on it. So there is some that is written in stone, certain turning points in the story that have to make sense for and be there for our story to actually be told, but how we get from A to B can also be in the actors' and the audience's hands, and I just desperately try and keep up by the keyboard. So, so, <laughs> It varies from show to show, but there, there will be a script, and but then I hand that over to the people who are actually going to be at the theatre on the night, so it's uh, up to them, I guess. Okay. So are the actors from an now the Are the actors from an uh, There's some of them are. So there's, a, there's an actor who, uh, who's called Dave Tall, who is a dancer with DV8, that I think has come here a few times. Um, a dance company called Dave and, and, and Dave, has has, Dave has appeared in every every one of our vampire shows because he plays Quinn, the greatest living vampire hunter. <laughs> uh, so he's been in all of them.